This morning we have from the Oklahoma Restaurant Association, Dean Daniel. Dean is the educational director for the association, so at this time, Dean Daniel. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for letting me come and speak with you. I know that maybe individually you didn't have anything to do with that, but that's, uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank you anyway, because you did maybe have the option of being here or not, right? I mean, you could have slept. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I thank you for that opportunity. I've been with the Oklahoma Restaurant Association for a couple of years now. Uh, basically, that is a title. Uh, it simply gives me uh, a direction to kind of put my energies, but I do a lot of everything. I go around and talk to individual owner and operators. I try to sell them membership into our association, which is a nonprofit organization. And I try to keep them abreast and up to date of what's going on in our industry. Uh, we try to deal with the problems that that individual is experiencing, whether it be a, a personnel problem, whether it be a, uh, trying to get supplies in from a new uh, purveyor. I'm trying to support them in any way that I can find uh, possible for me. I also prepare and give seminars to our members, uh, dealing from anything like waiter waitress training to sanitation, things of this nature. But basically, it's just a public relations job and a selling job. And, uh, and I'm not sure if maybe that isn't what all of us do to a certain degree anyway, right? We're kind of uh, involved in people and involved in uh, selling ourselves to them and making what we've got available and, uh, and hoping they take advantage of it. One of the things that I enjoy about going around and talking to people is that I get to, I get to hear the real nitty-gritty of what's going on sometimes. When you read the paper or you read a textbook or you hear someone come in and say this is the way it is, when you get out and talk to that manager who's actually going through the problems of, of trying to make a living out of this, sometimes you don't always hear the same thing. So I, I think it's, uh, it's exciting for me to go out and, 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 and deal with people right where they're living. And I'd like to just kind of share some of the things that I've, that I've encountered and that I think that you're going to encounter as you go out and try to, to become a chef or, a, or a, a baker or whatever it is that you're striving to become, an owner or a manager, hopefully. And as I try to share with you what it is I think that you're going to need to survive as you encounter what's out here in the, in the real world, as everybody calls it, I think I'll be telling you what they want so that you can, can kind of prepare yourself for that. So in other words, I'm doing it from your point of view rather than from the employer's point of view. And I, I hope maybe that, that says a little bit more to you. And at any time that we're going through this, if you have a question, just feel free to ask it. It's okay. But you have to realize that if I forget where I'm at, I have to go back and start from the beginning. So <laughs> we may be here a long time. No, you feel free to ask the questions because uh, I want you to get what you want out of this, okay? I, uh, I try very uh, diligently, if not very successfully, to build up this industry as best I can. Everywhere anybody will listen to me, I try to tell them, this is the greatest industry you can get into. And I believe that. I think it has the most opportunity. I think it has the most growth potential. I think there's money in it. I think there's satisfaction in it. I think there's a, a, a way of of uh, exerting your creative uh, talents and your skills, I think it's just unlimited. And as long as people will sit down and listen to me, and I know you're kind of a captive audience, boy, I just try to let everybody know that because I really believe it. And if you can get a little taste of that, if you can really sense that and believe that too, then I think you've got a, uh, you've got a head start on that person that's not really too sure if they want in the food service industry or not. I think you ought to be commended that you're taking a step or a series of steps to reach the goal of entering the food service industry rather than being that person who simply makes it a second choice. And I think maybe our industry is suffering from the fact that uh, we have too many people making it the second choice. It's almost like, well, I can't do anything else. I'll go to work in a restaurant. And I'll tell you, if you've got that head start of going out and saying, that's what I want to do now and preparing for it, you're way ahead of the ballgame. You ought to be excited about the fact that you're here. You really should. 
I think some of the problems that, are going, that you're going to be encountering, or maybe this industry is going to be encountering in the next year or two years, I'm just going to list them and not dwell on them too much because maybe at this point that, that doesn't mean too much to you. Uh, I'm just going to list them and then we'll just maybe go some other directions. I think first of all it's going to be the labor problem. We're still going to meet, be needing people. You've got to have the job done. You've got to have that skill out here, someone who can perform it. And the, the market um, is always going to be a problem for us, I think, until we can prepare more people like yourselves to fill those needs. I think the other one is interest rates. Now, I know that you're not to the point of owning or building your own operation yet, but uh, I think you need to be aware that the economy is, uh, is as it is and will be that way possibly for, uh, for another year or two. I see some changes, but I, I think it's still a, a difficulty for you. And I think maybe if you understand this from the employer's point of view, that he is having these problems, then as you prepare yourself in light of that, maybe you can uh, help, him, uh, help him out better. Uh, food costs. You've got to be dealing with that every day, and that employer does also. Uh, energy problems. They're not uh, going away, even though they're maybe lessening, they're not going away. And the creative person who finds ways of dealing with energy uh, costs is going to be uh, ahead of the game. Uh, competition. You're always going to have that competition. And I'm not sure you want to get rid of it, really, because it is that competition that makes you just a little bit better at what you do. Okay? I don't know whether you believe that or not, but I think it's right. That competition is there not to put you out of business, I don't think, but to make you better at what you already do well. And put some more money in your pocket, you bet. This industry that, uh, that I represent and that you are trying to become a participant in is one of the largest in the nation, if not the largest. We're talking about $133 billion last year in this industry. I don't know how big that is. <laughs> I don't know how many zeros that is. And it's more than the $20,000 I take, uh, I make, and I don't know how much I take home, but I don't take home very much. So uh, it's kind of mind boggling to, to believe that we're that much, that we're part of that big an industry. We really are. Let me share some of the things that I think will be important to you as you go out and try to try to become a success at this. I think one of the things that you're going to need most of all, and that is some good communication skills. And I say that very seriously. I know you're saying, I don't like English. <clears throat> I don't like the composition parts. Uh, you know, I don't like the public speaking part of it. But you have to realize that about 80% of your waking day is spent in communicating. And the more you know about how to do that very well, the better off you're going to be. You say, well, I'm just going to be a chef. What do I need to know about all this communication stuff? Well, let me tell you, I think it's very crucial that you know it. First of all, you're going to have to be interpreting things that are given to you from someone else. You're going to have invoices that you've got to deal with. You've got to have recipes that you're going to deal with. You've got to have uh, descriptions and uh, on new equipment that you're going to be entertaining about buying. You've got to be knowledgeable about how to look at that stuff, read it, and make sense out of it. I think it's important that you have those communication skills too because as you go out and enter the market, those people are looking for those kind of things. And they're looking for it to the degree that they're interested, yes, in your technical skill, but they're also going to measure how well you interact with people and how well you communicate with each other. The need is there. So that, yes, they're looking for technical skills, but they want human skills also. And I think you need some coping skills. And what I mean by that is that this industry has the reputation of being a very long hours, low pay, that isn't always true, but that's the, that's the reputation that we have. You need to know how to cope with whatever it is that you're going to encounter in that job or that jo those jobs. 
It could be uh, the, the, the stress that comes because you've got, uh, you're shorthanded all the time. You're understaffed. And I think every restaurateur knows about that problem. It seems that that is the problem of restaurateurs is that they're always shorthanded. Uh, it may be just increased turnover that you're having. And that's why you're shorthanded. How do you deal with that? Uh, it just may be the challenge of the competition that you're, that you're encountering. How do you handle that? And how well you handle it is going to be a measure of how successful you are as a, as a quality chef or a baker or an owner, manager. The hours, uh, a lot, our industry is becoming responsive to that. They're actually coming in and saying, hey, we're not going to work any of these 70-hour weeks anymore. We're going to work five days, maybe 10 hours a day. There's going to be two days in a row off, and may, maybe every third week we'll give you a third day off in a row. Our industry is becoming responsive. Uh, so uh, the best that you can cope within what they present to you, the better off you're going to be. And then I think you need some confidence. Now, where do you get that? can't go down to the store and buy it, um, but you really need it. And I think one of the things that I can share with you about where to get confidence is that you start believing in what it is that you're doing right now. Because there's something to learn from what you're doing right now. You, you may not be in the kitchen yet. You know, you might, may not be actually in food prep yet. But there's something to be learned from what you're doing right now. And the more you can learn from it right now, the better confidence you can have about what's going to happen when you do get into that food prep class. One of the first full-time jobs that I had when I got out of high school was a job that I worked during the summer before going to college. I worked 12 hours a day, six days a week, and I worked in this place where they made transistors for radios. Now, I guess with all the new computers and microchips and all this, they don't use transistors very much anymore. But I worked in the place where they, uh, after they had painted the little transistors, they had to put them in a kiln to dry, to dry the paint, to bake the paint on. And it was, the, the place that I put them into was uh, uh, on a conveyor belt that was kind of like a, uh, a pizza machine where you put them in one end and they were in there for a while on a belt and then they come out a finished product. And once that belt was turned on at six o'clock, on a Monday morning, it was never turned off until uh, uh, 6 o'clock Sunday morning. We had two shifts going, 12 hours apiece. I got to take two 15-minute breaks and one half-hour lunch hour. And the only way I got to take a half-hour lunch hour was that I would take a long uh, hook, a metal hook, and reach into that kiln as far as I could and go ahead and pull out prematurely all those pieces of stuff that I had stacked up because that belt never quit. And if I was gone too long, when I came back, they were all over the floor. So it was kind of, to me, a pressure situation, and I hated it. I just, it was, I didn't like the job. I know you've never been there, right? You, you always do everything you like. But I hated that job. Twelve hours a day, six days a week, for three months before I went to college. And it was kind of tradition. This is where everybody worked to get their, their, uh, their money for college during the summer. And the owner of the company always came around at the end of the, the uh, summer, and he always wanted to know two things. He wanted to know, first of all, did you enjoy what you're doing? And second of all, what did you learn? Well, I tell you what, when I saw Mr. Swartz coming down that aisle, and I turned off that machine, I was never so glad to see anybody in my life. I got to turn off that machine and quit. And he come up to me and handed me my paycheck, and he says, uh, and what did you, uh, how did you enjoy what you're doing? I said, I hated it. I says, this is so boring. I says, you could get an idiot to stand here 12 hours a day and do this. He says, I know. <laughs> and I said, and the second thing is, I didn't learn a thing. I didn't learn a thing that will help me when I get out and try to do what I want to do with my life. And he says, oh, yes, you did. I said, what did I learn? He said, you learned that you don't want to do this for the rest of your life. And he said, that might be the most important thing that you ever learned. So you can, yeah, you can learn in every situation that you find yourself in. Let me give you one more example. 
R.J. Williams owns a company in, in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, all his company does is make uh, textiles, which is cloth and uh, materials. And he has one machine that does nothing but that produces a certain kind of yarn, just the long strand of yarn, not the cloth. And they take that yarn and they ship it up to Philadelphia where it's woven into a special kind of cloth. And uh, what happened was that his machine broke down. And he says, you know, we have this multi-million dollar operation and this one little machine broke down. We've got enough going. I'm not going to put a lot of time and pressure into repairing that one machine just yet. You know, when we need it, I'll get to it. About three weeks later, he got a call from Detroit, Michigan. And the guy on the line says, are you the company that builds this special yarn and then ships it to Philadelphia where it's made into a special cloth and then they ship it to New Jersey where it's rubber coated and then it goes to Detroit, Michigan where it's cut into diaphragms for Cadillac, Cadillac carburetors? He says, well, we're the ones who prepare that special yarn, but I didn't know what happened to it. He says, well, you do now. And he says, I'll tell you what, you're two weeks late on your delivery, and we had to shut down the Cadillac division of General Motors because you forgot to repair your one machine. He didn't think it was important. And yet he was actually holding up General Motors. To me, that's pretty significant. So I don't care where you are and what it is that you're doing, what you're doing matters. It's very important. It's very crucial. And the more you can start to appreciate that right now, I think the better off you'll be when you actually present yourself to that employer saying, hey, I want to work for you. I want to work with you. And he's going to be looking down and seeing what kind of skills you have. And you're being prepared here with the technical skills and how to present the, the, the product that you, that you prepare. You're learning about sanitation, or you will be. You're learning about all that stuff. But the more you can learn about how important what you're doing is, gosh, you've got a head start. I think this is an exciting, exciting business. And I encourage you to develop yourself and to make everything that you can out of it. Um, I know in this state alone, in the two and a half years that I've been working here, I've encountered people that uh, have, have come from running a, a hamburger joint and they actually had to serve as their own bell hop or their own bell person, uh, car hop, and now they own uh, businesses worth uh, several million dollars. And that was just a few years ago. And then I would be honest with you and say that there are people who are running a little hamburger joint that are still running the same one they ran 20 years ago. You know, I'm not going to lie to you and say that everyone becomes a millionaire overnight, but the opportunity is there if you're willing to get involved in it well enough to make the best of every situation you get, present your skills the best you know how, learn the most you can while you're here, and when you get out, you'll have something of value to offer. It'll make a difference, and you will make a difference. You really will. It sounds almost like I'm giving a pep talk, and I know this isn't a pep rally. Uh, I wanted to be more informational and give you facts and statistics and what I, what I know. Uh, but honestly, a lot of what I would tell you in that area about three weeks from now would not, be, uh, would not be correct. Because that's one of the aspects of this industry is that it is dynamic and it is changing and it never stays the same. And that ought to excite you. It really should. Okay, how well have I confused you? Did I tell you anything you wanted to know? Did I share anything with you? How can I ask some answer some specific questions that you have?